Hi guys, we're gonna go over chapter 15. Um, quick review of 15.2. We have a reversible reaction and a chemical equilibrium. So I want you to remember that in order to have equilibrium, the reaction has to be reversible. So it has to be something can, that can unreact. Okay, so you have reactants forming products and then products can reform reactants. <clears throat> For equilibrium, I want you to think of equal rates. Okay, and over here, I'm gonna write, um, this is 15.2 equilibrium, equilibrium equals equal rates. So what that means is the rate of the forward reaction, so in this problem, A turning into B, is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction, B turning into A. So if we had, we started with 100 in our example, A, and it turned, started turning into B, when it reached equilibrium, um, I'm just gonna make up numbers, so let's say it stopped changing when they were about 70, 30. So that means every time one A turned into a B, a B turned back into A. So the numbers might go up a little bit, up and down a little tiny bit, like by one or two molecules, uh, but overall they stay constant. Are they equal? Not necessarily. So they're not gonna be 50-50, <clears throat> but they remain constant after we've reached equilibrium, okay? Let me erase those numbers because those are made up. Okay, so the other thing that we talked about was dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium. Equilibrium means <clears throat> that the reactions keep going. So the forward and reverse reactions keep going okay that's the dynamic part dynamic means changing so the molecules that are present are changing some of them are turning into product and some product are turning back into reactant so the reactions keep going but the concentrations remain constant okay or fairly constant Okay, so the concentrations, we've reached that balance point, and you'll see that in a second. Okay, so that is dynamic equilibrium. Let's look at the picture of that over here. So last chapter, we talked about the rate, the initial rates, or the instantaneous, or the average rate of a reaction. We were talking about this left side. This chapter, we're talking about the right-hand side where the concentrations level off and we've reached equilibrium. So everything from about this point to the right is where the concentrations stop changing. So they stop increasing or decreasing and they remain constant. This is our dynamic equilibrium over here. And law of mass action is just the relationship between our reaction that we're talking about so this is our reversible reaction here and k the value of the equilibrium constant okay so the name of this the fancy name is the law of mass action you put the products on the top so c and d go on top raised to their um, coefficient so for rate loss we had to somehow figure out with a chart a data table we had to figure out the exponents for rate laws, for equilibrium constant, it's not like that. It's whatever the coefficient is becomes the exponent. Okay, so it's, in my opinion, a little bit easier. And then the reactants go on the bottom raised to their coefficients. <clears throat> oh, and K, remember K is unitless. If K is a big number, as in, <clears throat> if K is one, then the two sides are balanced. The product and the reactants are equal. <clears throat> so if K is one, we know that they're equal. If K is greater than one or a large value, which is a subjective term, so we like to say like 10 to the third power or 10 to the sixth power, which be, would be a thousand or a million, we know that there's a lot more product than there is reactant left when it's reached equilibrium. Let's come back over here and see. 
which side of the equation does this equilibrium lie on? Since the, the green line is my reactant, it's going down, and the red and the blue are my products and they're going up, it looks like I have been left with more product than reactant at the end. So we would say this reaction lies to the right. I have more product, the NO and the O2, at the equilibrium, there's more of the red and the blue than there is of the green. Okay, so this reaction, this equilibrium lies to the right. Okay, there is more product than there is reactant when it's reached its balance point. <clears throat> okay, if K is small, so if it's less than one, um, a decimal, then you have more reactants at equilibrium then you have products and this happens a lot so the reaction starts and a little bit of products will be made um, but a lot of the reactants will just remain intact they're not going to turn into our product okay so that would look like a k that is less than one where the reactants are favored because remember you're dividing by reactants so if this is a big number like a hundred and this is a small number like one you will have one over a hundred which is you know, a small number. Okay, and we practice writing these out. So you just put the products on top, reactant on the bottom, raised to their exponents. Okay, and this is something that is very important that I would like to write down. Okay, so the equilibrium expression for a reaction is the reciprocal for a reaction written in reverse. I don't love the way that he worded that. So I'm going to refer to your book. I'm going to come over here to my notes and let's go over to the next slide. I will share these with you guys. <clears throat> In your book, this is, oh, we didn't write 15.3. We have K. Um, first, we need a reaction. So your book uses the little a as the coefficient. So the lowercase is the coefficient and the capital is whatever the compounds are. Okay, so if this is my um, reaction, the products are gonna go on top of my k, my equilibrium constant expression, c raised to the exponent of little c and d raised to the exponent of little d over a raised to whatever the coefficient of A is and B raised to the power of B. So this is how we write out the equilibrium constant expression. <clears throat> and we talked about what it means when K is much bigger than one, the reaction lies to the right products are favored. Okay, and when K is much less than one, so it's a decimal, the reaction lies to the left, which means that um, my reactants are favored. There's more reactants left when we've reached equilibrium. Okay. Okay, and in this section, this is the important stuff that's in the slides that we have not covered. So number one, <clears throat> this is um, changes in a reaction and how that's going to affect our K value. So changes in a reaction. Number one, if a reaction is reversed, <clears throat> so instead of this, if I reverse it and have C and D in equilibrium forming A and B as my product now, then K prime is the new equilibrium constant for my reverse reaction is going to equal one over K. So in other words, um, 
if k, like we said, was 1 one hundredth, then we reverse the reaction. The new k of the new reaction would be 1 over 1 one hundredth, which is 100. Okay, so it just, you take the reciprocal of the number if you reverse the reaction. Okay, number two, if you multiply, if you multiply the coefficients in a reaction by a number, so let's say you doubled everything, then you're going to raise k to that exponent. So um, for any number, we're going to use the lowercase n. So if you multiply the coefficients in a reaction by n, then k prime equals k to the nth power. So the original equilibrium constant, capital K, to the nth power is going to be your new equilibrium constant. And then last but not least, number three, if you add up um, reactions, um, let's see, chemical equations. So when we did mechanisms, we added the steps to get the overall. If you're doing that, if you add up chemical equations to get an overall, reaction, um, then you are going to multiply the corresponding equilibrium constants by each other. You multiply k at 1, k2, etc. Okay, so for example, if I had um, reaction one, going back and forth, and this was K1, and then I have reaction two, K2, and then we add those up to get a final K, the total K, it would be K1 times K2. So K prime, my new constant for the overall reaction would equal K1 times K2. Okay, and if you want more detail on these and why um, these rules apply, this is all found on page 683, and your book does a very good job of explaining it, so you guys can go back and read that there. Okay, so these are just little things that um, if you change part of the reaction, how does it affect the K? And we need to kind of memorize these, so we need to know those things. Okay. All right, 15.4, 15.4. This is expressing the equilibrium constant in terms of pressure. Equilibrium constant in terms of pressure, which we abbreviate as K with a capital P for pressure. K with an F. And there is an equation. Let's go over here. So equilibrium expressions involving pressure. If you have all gases, you can use the concentration in moles per liter of those gases. But usually when we have a gas, we don't measure moles per liter, we measure the pressure of those gases. Okay, and so you'll see right up here, it's the same exact thing that we've been doing, except instead of having brackets, which mean concentration, they put a capital P, for pressure. So I will go ahead and write this out. This is hydrogen and nitrogen making ammonia. So example, if I have hydrogen gas, that's a G, plus nitrogen gas, 
in equilibrium with NH3 ammonia gas. And I need to balance these out. That means I need three of these. <clears throat> I'm going to check my coefficients. Yeah, OK, we got it. Then KP, capital K, the equilibrium constant with regard to pressure is my product, the pressure of NH3. And it's squared still. Okay, but now we don't put it in brackets because remember that these brackets mean concentration and we're not working in concentration right now. We're working in pressure, so we use parentheses. Now, I know it sounds silly, but that's really important on the AP test. If you put brackets for pressure, it's wrong and they won't give you the point. So for pressure, we use parentheses. On the bottom, I have my reactant. So I have pressure of hydrogen gas. And that one is cubed because this three goes up here. And then lastly, the pressure of nitrogen gas, and that's to the first power. So I don't need anything there. Okay, so this would be Kp, the equilibrium constant in terms of pressure of reactants. And that's what he has here. Okay, so P in H3 squared. This is my pressure of nitrogen. This is my pressure of hydrogen. It's cubed. He put the three inside the parentheses, it's mathematically, it's the same thing. You're squaring it, <clears throat> cubing it, multiplying these, and then dividing. Okay, and so our regular K, when we were talking about concentration, was in moles per liter. If I want to use that moles per liter constant and change it to the constant with pressure, they're a little bit different. Pressure is measured in atmospheres and concentration is moles per liter. So I have this um, equation right here that kind of fixes that. So we are going to use this equation. Kp, the equilibrium constant in terms of pressure, is k. Your book has a little c there. That's for concentration. That's just the one that we've been doing already. So that's our regular k. This is for pressure, remember? So it's basically just units. And so to fix the units, I am going to multiply this one times R. That's my equilibrium, sorry, not equilibrium constant. That is R equals gas constant. Gas constant. And we can look that up. Your book is going to have it, I think, on the next page. Yeah, I'll put it right here. 0, 0.0. .0. 8206 liters times atmospheres over mole. Okay. Very weird units. Um, it's this number 0 0.082206. That's what R is. Times T, the temperature that we're working at. And then delta N, that's kind of a weird one. Delta N is the change in moles, the change in moles. So it's basically, you're gonna add up the moles of your product and subtract the moles of your reactant. <clears throat> um, we're gonna have to do some examples for that to make sense. Moles product minus moles reactant. Okay, so in our example up here, the moles of product is two. So you'd have delta N of this guy is two minus the moles of your reactant. It's three and one, so minus four. So that would be negative two. So the, your delta N in this equation up here would be negative two. Okay. And 15.5 is nice and easy. 15.5, 15.5, section 15.5. Um, this is heterogeneous, which we just know means it's different. Heterogeneous equilibria, plural. Okay, which just means it involves. S and L, solids and liquids. 
And here's the basic of the whole section. You don't include pure, I gotta put that word in there, pure solids or pure liquids in equilibrium constant. Equilibrium constant equations. Okay, and let's do an example. So your book has, for example, two carbon monoxide gas molecules or moles in equilibrium with CO2 gas plus carbon solid, okay, which is like charcoal. So if we were to write out K like normal, it'd be the concentration of CO2 times the concentration of C divided by CO, carbon monoxide, squared, okay? And concentration is moles per liter. So if you have um, like a little lump of carbon, which is charcoal, it's pictured as charcoal, okay, in this case. So you have charcoal and you have a certain number of moles per liter of charcoal and you double the amount of charcoal, you've doubled the moles and you've doubled the liters, okay? Because it's the density is actually, since it's a solid, we're talking about density and density doesn't depend on how much you have. So however much you have, it's, it's not gonna really change the concentration, okay? If it goes down, the moles are going down and the liters are going down because gases will fill up the container they're in. So it's not the same with gases, but solids and liquids, pure solids and pure liquids, the <clears throat> concentration doesn't really change, okay, as it goes away because you're losing moles and you're losing liters. So in other words, when you see an S or an L, you just don't write that one into the equation. So that was wrong, let's write it correctly. So you'd put, little c for concentration. It's just CO2 on top over CO squared. This would be my equilibrium constant expression. And pure liquids, like if you see H2O liquid or um, what would be liquid nitrogen, I guess you could say, N2 liquid, um, these ones, also you do not write them in the equilibrium constant expressions. The ones that aren't pure liquids would be like NaClAq, whoops, AQ, aqueous things you are going to put into the equilibrium constant expression. And we'll get, we'll talk about those a lot in a further chapter. Um, but aqueous does go into the equilibrium constant. L, pure liquids, or S, pure solids, do not go into the equilibrium constant expression. Okay, all right, so we leave those out and we will pick up with 15.6 tomorrow and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I will see you then, take care.